Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. And uh, you know what? It's a, it's a very enjoyable thing for me to uh, look out. And as I look out to see, well, even as I wander through the halls, to see so many people enjoying being with each other, talking with each other, encouraging each other, fellowshipping together. Um, but it means that we don't always start exactly right on time. So, but, uh, but very, very good to, uh, to see that, and sorry to have to break it up at this point a little bit. Um, but uh, we're going to just take a look briefly in our bulletins at our opportunities and announcements for the course of the week and weeks to come. And uh, I'll start, first of all, by uh, mentioning our prayers and praises. Our Youth of the Week this week is Micah Luscombe. Uh, there's Micah. Micah's over to the left and uh, growing taller every week. So grade seven, or yeah, grade seven. Mike is in grade seven, and uh, so you can be praying for him. Our family of the week are Rob and Heather Lensink and, uh, and all of their kids. And uh, so Rob and Heather uh, have been coming to the church, boy, it's about two years now. Yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, it began, began partway into COVID, and uh, uh, great to have them as part of the church family. You can continue to pray for them uh, as you take a look at our opportunities and or as our other prayer matters. Um, praise God for his continual provision. Uh, he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. And uh, I hope that none of you got hit too badly with the storm that went through the other day. But it is good to have the ground uh, wet and uh, things growing. So we're thankful for God's provision that way. Uh, praying for Cheryl Hosner's continued healing from surgery as she recuperates at home. Uh, praying for our school kids as they get closer to the end of the academic year and they're finishing assignments and tests. And uh, continue to pray, please, for our outreach with the good news to the community as we continue in the harvest. There are opportunities to engage with people all the time as we're going out into Springfield and uh, just, just connecting with people uh, talking to them, sharing, sharing faith with them, praying for them. So please continue to uh, pray for our outreach as a church family that we will be faithful to our mission, following Jesus Christ and sharing the good news. Um, mentioned at the bottom here, Marcy will be on vacation from May 23rd to the 29th. And so Donna Fuller is taking care of the bulletin. Uh, and if you, if you need something added to the bulletin, please make sure you get in touch with Donna. And please contact Betty Horn uh, to initiate the prayer chain during that time. Uh, in the office this morning, as I walked in, there were people who came to Marcy for batteries and then other people who came to Marcy for pencils and pens. So life isn't going to fall apart when she's away, but please make sure that you get in touch with those who are going to... Uh, uh, be able to help kind of keep things held together a little bit. And, uh, and we hope that the Tank family has a great vacation. Uh, finally, gets a little bit of chance to, to rest and enjoy their time away. As far as uh, the upcoming week is concerned, in the harvest on Tuesday, family prayer meeting on Wednesday, and youth group. Uh, we're going to be going mini golfing on Friday in Tilsonburg at 7 o'clock. Uh, you're going to need to bring some money from mini golf. It's not that expensive, but I can't tell you the dollar, dollar value right off right now. Seven dollars. There we go. So seven dollars. Uh, so so that's in Tilsonburg at seven o'clock. Um, it's on the it's on the north end of Tilsonburg. If you need directions further, you can you can talk with me, and I can tell you how to get there. Um, there's uh, a notice here regarding signing up for the Father and Son Night Out, which is going to be Saturday, June 11th at 6 o'clock. It's going to be here at the church, and uh, there's going to be music and food and fellowship. And uh, so, so we always enjoy that opportunity to get together, fathers and sons, and please be aware of that. Uh, it's, uh, the costs are covered by donation. There's going to be a donation box in the foyer if you can help with that. And if you're thinking of coming, please make sure that you sign up as soon as possible on the desk out at the back uh, because this helps as far as the planning is concerned for the, for the evening. Uh, there is going to be our annual general meeting held Sunday, June the 12th. Uh, this will not be an extremely long meeting. 
Uh, this, is, this is more, we have a portion of our meeting that tends toward operations. We had that portion of the meeting already. We have an, a portion of the meeting that tends toward administration and the things that we have to do as a charitable corporation. This is going to be more the administrative portion of that meeting, but we do need people there for it. We need the membership to be there so that we have a proper quorum for this. So that's Sunday, June 12th. There's going to be a potluck following the morning service with the meeting to follow. We are not above bribes, okay? We are not above bribing people to be there, so there will be good food. Please be aware of that. Um, and then the, the other thing that uh, I want to mention here is the video team is in need of volunteers to oversee the live stream and, and uh, share the lyrics and other media on screen. And you will be trained in how to use the equipment uh, as far as the computer is concerned and the camera is concerned. So if you can help with that and are interested in, in training in that area, please talk to Matt Sawatsky. He's, uh, he's taking charge of things there and he's able to help you with that. So those are our opportunities and announcements and I'm going to ask the worship team to come and lead us now, if they would please, in worship. Thank you. Good morning. I welcome you to the SBC, and uh, I welcome you to join us in worship. And this first song um, might be new to a few of you, but uh, if you know it, sing along. Uh, it's called no longer slaves. Stand with us as we sing, Come People of the Risen King.
Zeth and Emery to do special music for us. All right, so we're going to do a song that uh, is a newer song. Um, some of you maybe know it, and you're welcome to sing along uh, if you do. Uh, this is just kind of a neat song. It's about how we have uh, joy together as God's family into what God has called us into. It's called House of the Lord. Uh, it's by um, an artist called Phil Wickham, so probably most of you are familiar with it. And one of the main... Um, lines in the song is that there's joy in the house of the Lord. And so, uh, of course, I hope as we gather together uh, in church that we have joy on a Sunday morning, but this song isn't about uh, joining to get, this is, song isn't just about having joy as a church when we gather together. It's about uh, the fact that positionally before God, we are in his household now. And what Christ has done for us and bringing us into God's household is our source of joy. And so we're going to sing this song together, and hopefully I don't go too fast here. of the Lord today, we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, yeah, we shout out your praise, we shout out your praise. Thank you, 
guys. I now invite you to stand with us again as we sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Thank you very much, Jordan and Sophia and Amy and Isaac and Leif for leading us in our time of worship together. It's uh, good to be together. It's good to be able to take time and to sing the praises of God, to, to remember his goodness to us in so many things. And uh, kids, you're going to head out now. It's junior church time. So I hope that you guys have a great time out there. And who's teaching today? Pardon? Carrie? lesson today, Carrie, is about Zacchaeus and the prodigal son. You guys are getting a twofer. That's good. She figured that I was preaching today, so she was going to have to tell two stories in order to cover that time. Okay. Well, you enjoy, you enjoy that time with Mrs. Thiessen, and make sure you listen very carefully, and learn lots, and let's pray, and you guys can head out. Father, thank you for allowing us to be together to worship you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for life that we have because of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for these kids. We thank you for uh, kids who are able to be part of our church family, for parents and grandparents and, and family around them who love them and who are desiring to teach them what is good and right and to show them Jesus. And I pray as they go to junior church right now that uh, you would help them to learn on a level that they can understand. We thank you for those who are dedicated to teaching the kids and to, uh, to pointing them to your son who is the way and the truth and the life. Um, please, please work through this time in their hearts and minds and lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, kids, see you later. Okay. Have a good time. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, please, adults, if you would, to Luke chapter 20, as we continue on in our study in the Gospel of Luke. We're looking at Luke chapter 20, we're beginning at verse 41. Luke 20, beginning at verse 41. And as we go into the Word, uh, I, was, uh, I was thinking about something that came to my mind as I was looking at the, the nature of what it is. Uh, that Jesus is speaking to here. And uh, you, you never know what you'll see when you live in the middle of the woods, which I do. Uh, a few years back, my nephew Ben and I were just pulling into my driveway. And as we were pulling into the driveway, I had to jam on the brakes of the Toyota that I was driving. Because lying there on the driveway, 
sunning himself on the warm gravel was a great big snake. Now, if I lost you at the word snake, you are not a Twinum. Because you see, Twinums tend to think of snakes as a pretty exciting find. At least the kids and I do. Joanne kind of humors us. But the kids and I, we think snakes are a pretty exciting find. So I threw open the driver's side door, jumped out of the car, and rushed toward him. And what a find it was. It was an eastern hognose snake. Now, hognose snakes are nicknamed puff adders because of their loud, aggressive hiss. And there are legends attached to that hiss. In fact, I had an old farmer one day when I was a kid tell me that once he had seen a puff adder hiss in the direction of his cows, and a bunch of his cows fell dead in the field because of the poisonous breath of this snake. Which isn't true, but it makes a good story, and he was committed to that story. He was sticking to it. Anyway, I was looking forward to the snake following his little routine, and he didn't disappoint. Upon seeing me, he immediately reared up and he hooded out like a cobra. They're very cool that way. They don't just like rear up to strike. They actually do the whole hood thing. They spread out like a cobra does at the top. And so it's, I, I have to say for the uninitiated, it looks pretty intimidating. In fact, as I got close to him, my nephew immediately yelled as he was hooding out, Uncle John, stay back. He's going to bite you. And you would have thought so if you saw the pose and the wide open mouth and you heard the hiss. But here's the thing about puff adders. They look big and scary, but they're all show. So I put my hand right in front of his face and he struck at me with his mouth shut. So really it was a bump with his nose. That's how they, that's how they try and scare you away. So he struck at me with his mouth shut. And then when he did that, I put my hand around his neck and I picked him up. And when I picked him up, he immediately went limp and in a couple of seconds, saliva and blood started to dribble out of his mouth. At that point, Ben said, Uncle John, you killed him. I hadn't though. It's all part of the act. Even the saliva and blood. They put on this whole fantastic show and they play dead if you aren't scared away after they've tried to intimidate you. The hognose pretends to be something he's not. And after I showed him to Joanne, Joanne humors me when I bring her my treasures, after I took her up to the house and showed her to Joanne, I set him down in the grass, and as soon as I turned my back on him, he slithered off into the bush because he figured, okay, I've managed to trick him, he thinks I'm dead, now I can flip over onto my stomach and slide away, and that's exactly what he did. Animal mimicry is pretty amazing. If you've ever seen a cecropia moth, you know that when they open their wings, there are two big eyes staring at you. And hopefully those eyes look enough like the eyes of a large predator to scare a little bird away if it's swooping down and suddenly it sees these eyes appear in front of it. Or maybe you've seen a killdeer do a great impersonation of a broken wing to lure you away from its nest. If you've ever seen them do that, you think, wow, that bird is injured. I've got to help it. A and you may not know this, but snapping turtles sit down at the bottom of a pond, and as they snip da sit down at the bottom of a pond, they open their mouths wide and they wiggle their tongues so it looks like a pink worm, and any fish swimming by and seeing that pink worm suddenly finds itself snapped when it thinks to itself, I can catch that worm. It's all fake and it's all fascinating. Creatures pretending to be what they're not. And, and I think it's great. I just, I just have, a, have a really fun time with all this stuff. But we know it's not so great when people who claim to follow Christ are not what they pretend to be. We've seen the damage that it does when religious people put on a show and they claim an allegiance and they act like something outwardly in certain settings and certain venues, but in fact, they're faking it. 
I would say, in fact, that there's nothing Jesus spoke against more strongly than this. There are many things that Jesus Christ will warn about. One of the biggest ones is hypocrisy. When he condemns fake religion, he uses that word, hypocrites. Now, that's an interesting word. The Greek word is very similar to the English word. The, the origin, the original word is the word hypocritos. And hypocritos, or hypocritos, whichever way you say it, means stage actor. Or more literally, it means interpreter from behind. And that kind of sounds weird until you understand that in Greek theater, actors wore masks and they interpreted the story that they were telling from behind the mask. So stage actor or interpreter from behind. The word hip uh, hypocrite or hypocritos doesn't appear in the scripture that we're looking at today. But that's what this section is all about. And Jesus does tear the mask off of spiritual stage actors. If you remember what's been going on as we've continued and come to this point, Israel's religious leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, have been nitpicking at Jesus. They've been trying to use lawyers' arguments and convoluted questions to trip Jesus up and to show that he doesn't understand religion as well as they do, or better yet, that he's a blasphemer worthy of death. And so they want to get him on some sort of technicality. They want to convict him because he doesn't give a right answer. And they're hoping that if they can get him just to trip up on his words and to give the wrong answer, that they can have the crowd condemn him and that they can see him killed. And as this has gone on, this word play, these attempts to trip him up, Jesus has had enough. And it's come to the point where he is decided to go on the offensive. There's not going to be any more games. There's not going to be any more pretending. And the words we're reading today are Jesus now fighting back. And he's exposing the hollowness and fraud of hypocritical worship. He's exposing the hollowness and fraud of people who pretend to be pious, but in fact, inside, are rotting, stinking, spiritual corpses. And so he speaks against worship that's big on the outward show, but hides dark hearts that have twisted the worship of the Holy One for their own selfish ends. And as we come to this section today, we're going to actually look at three incidents. I'm going to try not to take too long, but we're going to look at three incidents because they really fit together. And they present to us a time and a place and a culture that is different than ours. First, Ju first century Judaism in the city of Jerusalem at the heart of Old Covenant worship. But the truth of the message, even though it is a time and a place and a culture, the truth of this message is still an essential to rem reminder to us if we would worship God in spirit and in truth today. If we are going to be true worshipers of God, this is something that encourages, shapes, warns, reminds us of what we don't want to be and what we do want to be. So I want to read for you, beginning at chapter 20, verse 41, where it says this, But he said to them, How can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins, and he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. So we come to this passage, we come to this section, and I read these together deliberately and on purpose because we need to understand the flow 
of what's being said here as Luke records what's happening in Jesus' final days before his trial, before his crucifixion. So what lessons and warnings do we take away from these incidents as we look to authentically follow Jesus? What lessons and warnings do we take away if we're going to be true worshipers and actually, not just outwardly, but inwardly, the people of God? What do we take away from this? First thing that we take away from this uh, comes out of what looks like a somewhat innocuous question. And that first lesson we take away from this is what we believe about Jesus matters. What we believe about Jesus matters. We we know historically that as we look at this, we're in the transition period from one covenant to another. We're, We're in the space that is kind of B.C. to A.D., Jesus has come into the world, and as Jesus Christ has come into the world, the old covenant people of God had been waiting for the promised Savior. They had been waiting for his rescue from brokenness. That's all B.C. Now Jesus is here. And the old covenant people of God are having to figure out what that means. They know that the world is broken. And we know that the people of God were looking for a kingdom where it wouldn't be. And they were looking for the coming king. And so God sent Jesus to be that coming king. And in his time, what happens as we follow Jesus through in the Gospel of Luke and as we follow him through in any of the Gospels and then in the epistles that explain more fully who Jesus is, in his time on earth, Jesus emphatically grounds the nature of God's kingdom and the shape of God's kingdom in himself as the king. He calls it my kingdom. And he makes it very clear that he is the king of the kingdom of God. Now, this is why this question, we read it and and we don't see any passion or we don't see any battle in this question. But this question is actually a battle question. This is a combative question that Jesus Christ is asking. Because the religious leaders who he is now turning the tables on, who have been nitpicking at him, who have been trying to find ways to, on technicalities to say, see, he doesn't know what he's talking about, or see, he's a blasphemer, see, he deserves to be executed. Jesus is turning the tables on them, and he is showing that these religious leaders who viewed themselves as protectors of doctrine, including a right view of what the Messiah was or who the Messiah was and and what God's kingdom would be, he's trying to show that these people who viewed themselves as the guardians of right worship and of true religion were not that. That they were false, that they were wrong, that they were fakes. And in fact, we know as we followed through the gospel that these religious leaders rejected the king that God had sent. They rejected him regardless of the evidence of his words. They rejected him regardless of the evidence of his actions, of his miracles. They were determined to say that Jesus was not the Messiah. In fact, fact, when Jesus Christ did his acts of power, we know that they attributed very good things to the power of Satan. They did everything they could to defy and to twist everything that Jesus did. To say, do not follow this man He is not who he claims to be. In fact, out of this, as we see this happening, you might remember that a few weeks ago we were taking a look at a a couple of parables that Luke tells. And in those parables that Jesus relates and that Luke records, we looked at parables that show the religious leaders, Jesus predicting the religious leaders rejecting and killing the son and heir who will be the king of the kingdom. So we know they got the Messiah all wrong. They they completely, completely had a wrong picture of who the Messiah would be. And and so Jesus asked this question that looks technical, but it's combative. And what he's doing as he asks this question is he's exposing the fact that everything the religio political leaders believe and teach about the Messiah is wrong and distorted. 
they've got it all wrong. He says, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? Now, that's an interesting question for Jesus to ask because we know that Jesus was, in fact, physically the son. He was physically a descendant of David. The gospel writers are at pains to make this clear because it fulfills prophecy. So, for instance, if you take a look at the genealogies that are given to us in Matthew and Luke, both of them trace back to David. And if you take a look at what happens through the course of the Gospels, different times, Jesus is called the son of David. Remember blind Bartimaeus yelling out, Have mercy on me, son of David. And, and, so, and so the fact that Jesus is the physical son of David is very clear. The Messiah is supposed to be from the line of Israel's greatest hero, the king of its golden age. That's who David is. He's the king of the golden age of Israel. If you go to Jerusalem today, there is still a famous hotel in the middle of Jerusalem called the King David Hotel. And David's name is on various things because David is the picture for Israel of their golden age. The time when they had the most power, the time when they had the biggest land base, the time when they were wealthiest, and, and, and David and his son Solomon were, were what Israel looks back to as this was the best time in our history. But here's the problem. These religious leaders, as people shaped by their own wrong motives, these religious political leaders had made the Messiah, the son of David, and their understanding of him, they had made it a repeat of that golden age. And so they viewed the Messiah as being all about political glory and military conquest and power. So in their understanding of the Messiah, David, the ancestor, was the ideal and the pattern. The Messiah was going to imitate and follow him. He was going to be exactly what David had been. Military king, he was going to come in, he was going to fight Rome, he was going to beat Rome, he was going to then take, and what he was going to do was he was going to lead Israel in all sorts of conquests. They were going to expand their political power and might and their economic riches, and they were going to become this, this incredible, incredible force on the world stage. And, and this is an interesting and useful thing for us to understand because honestly, the lure of the material political kingdom has been a seduction and temptation even for professing Christians. Ever since Constantine, the Roman emperor, had his dream of a fiery cross in the sky before the battle of the Mulvian Bridge. The lure, the seduction and temptation for professing Christians has been also a lure toward material, political, powerful kingdom. Even today in Canada, there are those whose view of the kingdom is essentially of a religious political kingdom that is going to be brought in by conquest, and by the ability to take control of the political systems. This has been the seduction and this has been a lure for Christianity for thousands of years. I trace it back to Constantine first. Before that, the church was very clear that their kingdom was different. Somehow, if you think about it, most of the church's worst historical moments have been about that temptation. If you want to trace back through and consider the times when the church has had the worst witness in the world, its worst witness has been all about succumbing to those kinds of temptations. And we still see today the coming of the kingdom tied to political, even military success in many people's minds. How many of you have heard of white Christian nationalists? Have you heard that phrase, white Christian nationalists? That's an interesting phrase. All you have to do if you really want in a discerning way to pull that phrase apart is stay, say, Christ's 
white nationalists. Doesn't that sound like an oxymoron as soon as you say it that way? Christ's white nationalists? Hmm. We have an interesting, interesting thing to deal with here as we look at what Jesus is correcting in the minds of these people. And as we think about how this has been the lure and the temptation and the seduction for Christians through the centuries. Somehow, somehow we have to understand that when people do that, they turn Christianity into a political, possibly even military movement. Let's understand that they are looking right by the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Or they're looking right past Jesus' words, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, I would fight. That's what Jesus said. My kingdom is not of this world. If it was, I would fight. To make his point, as Jesus is taking the, and, and taking the religious political leaders to task here, he appeals to a messianic psalm that David wrote, in which David says this, Yahweh, the Lord, said to Adonai, my Lord, this is, this is where he's taking and, and what he's taking them to. He's taking them to the Hebrew, the Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David himself, he is telling them, acknowledged that the Messiah was superior, that he was the precedent setter, that he was the pattern, he was not the copy. So Jesus was not going to be the David of the golden age reincarnated. He was going to be the king of a different kingdom. Now, this is not a denial of physical sonship, but Jesus is talking about the fact that something much bigger is going on here. Someone much greater is here. And this is a good reminder for us. Whenever my reframing of Jesus matters more than who the Word shows us he is, or if I am advancing my own agenda or wishes in the name of Jesus, or if I'm willing to defy the character and call of Jesus and ignore the mission of Jesus and claim that what I'm doing is for him, I am on a course to do great evil and great damage, humanly speaking, to the glory of God. I am on the course to do great evil and great damage to the glory of God. Now, I, I want to stop, and I want to just give you a little bit of a caveat here. Does that mean, for instance, when it comes to us living in this world and the whole issue of, for instance, political decisions we make, that our Christianity doesn't affect it? It absolutely does. We want, as we vote, for instance, to make decisions that are in keeping with the moral and ethical teachings of Christ. We want to make decisions that mean that what we're doing is we're thinking things through with the mind and the heart of Christ. But what we never do is look to the political kingdoms of the world and somehow think that that is the kingdom. And the fact is, I think many times Christians get lured into, are seduced by, and tempted to think that somehow their political action is bringing in the kingdom. Do you know how the kingdom comes? The kingdom comes one heart at a time. Changed, trusting Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ doing its work. Which doesn't mean that we don't stand for good. Which doesn't mean that we don't speak for good. But ultimately, if you want to bring in the kingdom, then you have to be sharing the gospel. Because the kingdom comes one heart at a time. It comes when people trust the king who conquered by dying, not the king who conquered by fighting. So this is where Jesus Christ starts as he talks to these guys. And their picture of the fact 
that they were going to do the kingdom by conquest. That the Messiah was going to be a repeat of David's golden age. That's the first thing that we learn. That's the first lesson and, and warning for us that we take away from these incidents. The second one is this. We understand that false worship is worship that is very much out of line with the heart and character of God. In the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. As he took a look at these ones who had rejected him, who had rejected the biblical understanding of the Messiah, the true Messiah, he now turns and he tears the masks off the religious political elite in a very public way in the hearing of all the people. The worship of God has been twisted by them. It's been used by the guardians of the system for their own self-elevation. And so he talks about different things that are characteristic of them. They want robes that draw honor to them. They, they want robes that give them recognition. So the people look and say, oh, there's an important person going by. They're hungry for people to defer to and bow and scrape to them in the marketplace. Their idea of worship is actually about the elevated status for them that means they occupy the prime real estate in places of worship. They occupy the seats recognized as for the important people. As I said in Sunday school, I think for Baptists, the, the important seats are the back row seats. You know, if, you're, if, you're, if you're in the back row, you're occupying the prime, prime real estate in a Baptist church. But, uh, sorry, Terry. <laughs> but but, uh, but as, we, as, we, as we think about this, uh, the, these guys, they expected to be guests of honor and first to the food at the potluck. And, and the particular pot, uh, perks that are laid out here, they might not transfer to our time and to our place, but we do understand the mindset that Jesus explains is the hypocrisy of false worship. And that mindset is this. They were using the worship of God for their own ends. They were using the worship of God for self-enrichment, for, uh, to be self-centered, to be self-important, and to gain personal power. So it wasn't a worship of God. It was a worship of self under the disguise of worship for God. They were looking for self-enrichment. They were self-centered. They were self-important. It was all about personal power. And by the way, this is just a, just a, a thought. This isn't a... This isn't a um, moment of self-congratulation, but it's an explanation. This is why I said before no when someone asked me whether I wanted a, per, a pastoral parking spot. And, I mean, it's kind of typical at churches that a lot of churches have pastoral parking spots. It felt just a little bit, to me, too much like what Jesus was teaching against here. And, I, and I'm not saying with this, this isn't a condemnation of pastors who have parking spots, and, and we have an extremely kind church family who are very generous to us. But for me, the pastoral parking spot feels just a little bit like trying to get a perk. It feels just a little bit like what Jesus is condemning here. So one of the things that I really appreciate when I drive in on Sunday morning is I appreciate the fact that so many of you who are serious about following Jesus Christ, and who, are, who are here and who are part of ministry, you park as far away from the main entrance as possible. Because I think, that's good. We've got a servant's mindset here where we're looking and saying, we want to make sure that the people who are visitors get to be close. And we want to make sure that our seniors get to park close. That's a good thing. We want to have that sort of mindset where we understand that worshiping God is not about serving us. Worshiping God is about loving him and serving others. And, and as Jesus condemns the scribes here, he saves the worst of what they do until the last. The, <clears throat> the first things that Jesus listed show how hypocrisy the hypocrisy of false worship leads to greed and self-centeredness and self-importance. But look at the last one he talks about here. He says, he says of the scribes that they do all of these things to gain honor for themselves. And then he says, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. 
The last one he mentions here is they devour widows' houses while covering it all up with sanctimony and pretensions of piety. And so what he does is he adds all of the self-centeredness of their actions previously. He adds to that the ruthless exploitation of the powerless. That joins into the mix. And this underlines for us just how far false worship departs from Christ and how much false worship is the opposite of Christ, doesn't it? It makes it very, very clear to us. The law that these guys claim to be experts in and to guard spoke strongly about protecting the vulnerable and widows. Not only did the law speak about it, but the Old Testament prophets would come along when Israel was at its spiritual worst, and they would condemn the nation when it allowed justice to be perverted and orphans and widows to be taken advantage of and left to poverty and starvation. So the law says it, the Old Testament prophets say it, and as we understand it as followers of Jesus Christ, James, Jesus' brother, writes this to the early church at the end of James chapter 1. He says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to, f to care for orphans and widows in their hardship and to live holy lives. To care for orphans and widows in their hardship and to live holy lives. So Jesus exposes the hypocrisy and fraudulence of the experts, quote, in God's law. They claimed that they knew God's law, but they were defying the very heart of God who loves the weak and loves the needy and loves the vulnerable. We're going to continue on. I don't want to go long, but this is key for us as we understand what comes next. Because what we read next, the very next incident, often is preached as our paradigm for giving, but it's not. What we see next is not the paradigm for how you're supposed to give. It's not something that I'm supposed to preach to you and say, hey, you give your offering just like this. This is the picture of a house devoured. false religion these scribes who were going against the heart and character of God were devouring widows houses Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins and he said truly I tell you this poor widow has put in more than all of them for they all contributed out of their abundance but she out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. This is a house devoured. You might or might not know that your Bible's chapter divisions and verse divisions are not divinely inspired. They were added to the text in about 1260 A.D. by a man named Stephen Langdon. And, and the chapter and verse divisions are useful. They're a, they're a handy way to index long section of write, sections of writing and find what you're looking for. In fact, the original Greek and Hebrew don't even have spaces between words. So it's pretty wild when you take a look at Greek and Hebrew as in the, in the texts that have been found, the original texts that have been found, because they're like continuous lines of letters with no spaces, no punctuation, nothing. And, and so, and so the, the verses and the chapter divisions were added to make it easier for us to find things. But sometimes these chapter divisions and these verse divisions mentally break things up in our mind so that we can miss the flow of a thought and how things connect. So take away 21... To take away the space, take away the title, the widow's offering. Jesus had just confronted powerful, presumably wealthy religious leaders about devouring widows' houses. And now he's watching as some of these same presumably wealthy, powerful religious leaders 
drop money into the temple offerings. And a widow wanders up and she drops the end of her livelihood, two tiny little copper coins, her last two little copper coins into the same chest in this magnificent building in front of these men in fancy robes and walks away. These two little coins will be going to sustain other pious hypocrites and a magnificent temple building. This is just what Jesus had been speaking against in verse 47. This is the devouring of the widow's houses. And it's important that we get this because this passage is often presented to us as a command. This is how you should give. That's not the point at all. Jesus looks on the woman with compassion, and he is even remarking on the beauty of her deep, authentic faith when he says this. But he's also pointing to a tragedy. He is pointing to something that's tragic. This is where false religion can go. Hucksters and frauds working their system, taking advantage of the needy, and leaving them to hardship. It happens today. One of the interesting things in all of the prosperity gospel churches has been there, there was a group that went through and did a study of the prosperity gospel churches' parking lots. And you're thinking, parking lots? Well, they noticed that there were Cadillacs, Cadillacs and luxury cars only in very specific parking spots. Those are the church staff parking lots. That's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? That for the most part, they were dealing with people who would have been on the lower end of the economic spectrum, except those who had compiled enough money to get, them Gulfstream, get themselves Gulfstream jets and mansions and various other things like that. Fraudsters and hucksters who were working the system for all that they were worth. This is where false religion can go. Houses being devoured while the temple is being beautified and the religious leaders are getting rich. These men who were outwardly pious were inwardly morally and ethically rotten. And they were involved in performing worship rituals in one of the architectural wonders of the ancient world while they were devouring widows' houses. Again, I've said to you the verses and the, and the chapter divisions can sometimes break down for us the flow of where the chapter's going. I'm just going to give you a quick glance ahead to the next section and just mention it to you because Luke follows through right after the widow has dropped her two coins in and Jesus says she's given the very last of what she owns. The disciples are marveling at the beauty of the temple and its offerings in the next section. And Jesus says, it's all going to be torn down. Think about what that is. That's judgment. That's judgment. Jesus is declaring judgment on hypocrisy, on people who are taking advantage of other people. They had rejected him for selfishness disguised as worship that devours widows' houses, and we see a widow giving the last of her money to sustain them, and Jesus points to the fact that it's the last of their money, and then when the disciples get caught up in the outward, in the visual, in the material, in the surroundings, in the beauty of the surroundings, Jesus says it's all going to be burned to the ground. It's all going to be burned to the ground because this is not who I am and this is not my kingdom. The problem isn't that the temple was beautiful. God had commanded it to be built as the symbol of his presence and as a reflection of his glory. The problem is that the temple was hollowed out. It had been emptied of its meaning. 
The temple was the place where God showed them mercy. And holy Israel was to reflect the same to its weakest and neediest and most vulnerable. Do you know what's at the center of the temple? The mercy seat. The temple was the place where God dwelled, and at the center of the temple was the mercy seat. This was where God had showed a weak and needy and small people mercy. And they, in turn, were supposed to be people who reflected his care and his heart for the weakest and neediest and most vulnerable. And now, religious power brokers took advantage of sincere widows. And you know what? It's good that the widow loved and worshipped God. And Jesus does look at her and he, and he cares for her. And he points to her authenticity and sincerity. But it will be better for her when this system and symbol that devours her house no longer exist. Judgment. This is the reminder to us that before God, our external and our internal, our visible and our hidden must be in alignment. What we are outwardly must be in alignment with who we are inwardly. We will fail. We will fall out of alignment, but we can't be satisfied with that. The old temple and the worship it represented and the people in charge of it they had hollowed out. They had become fake. As the new and living temple, that can't be us. Because that's who you are. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are the new and living temple. And as the new and living temple, we can't be hollowed out. So we need to truly seek to know the Christ who lives in these pages. We need to know who he is, we need to know how he calls us to live. We need, need to know the mission he calls us to. We don't twist him to our desires and aims and ends. He is our creator and our king, and we belong to him. We don't use him for power ends, for economic ends, for political ends, for anything. We serve him. He is our king. And on the discernment end of things, there are all kinds of people and ministries vying for your ears and your eyes and your attention and your support. And there are many that are good and genuine. But let's recognize, let's be aware of what is fake and stay away. And let's recognize those who try to use Jesus for their own ends and stay away from them. Let's be discerning people because if there's one thing that I've seen over the last two years in the church of Jesus Christ, it's been a lack of discernment. And people have been sucked into so many things. We have got to make sure that we keep our eyes on Christ. And when you see a church where celebrity and power and wealth and status are cozying up to it are the thing, when we see that, that should make us run the other way. Because that is not the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's very different than the kingdoms that humans try to construct. And pure religion is most easily visible in that it shows the heart of Christ and it cares for orphans and widows and it doesn't devour their houses. This is what we must be as people of the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for the picture we have of Jesus Christ standing in our defense against what is false and against what takes and defiles worship and makes it something that it shouldn't be. Help us to be people who continually come back to him, to who he is, and who he calls us to be, and the mission he has sent us on into this world, lights in a dark place, people who speak truth, 
who speak eternal life, the words of eternal life, to those who are dying. Help us to show Jesus because we have a very clear understanding of who he is and your spirit is at work in us. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. We're going to sing a different song this morning. We're going to sing, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. I'm going to ask if you'll stand with me and we'll sing this. This is, I think, it's a, it's a little bit challenging because it's kind of old poetry, but it's really worth thinking through. Okay? As we sing it, as we sing it, uh, I'll, I'll encourage you to think it through, and if when we sing it, we kind of get through it too fast so that you don't really have time to think through the implications of it all because of some of the language choices and stuff, you can go back and review it. You can pull it up and look at it and read it and think about it. Come thou found of every blessing. Let's sing it together. <coughs> Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues of Praise his name, I'm fixed upon it. Name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto thy love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring me safely home by. sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God he to rescue me from danger bought me with his precious blood oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to let thy goodness, like a better, find my wandering unto thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forever. Amen.